Great. Hi, Anissa. It's so awesome to have you on the Genetic Genius Podcast today. Welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to you today about how just your whole expertise on women's health and fertility from, from preconception all the way through and your amazing nutrition tips. So let's just jump right in and get started. But first, I just want the listeners to learn about you and what you do and your passion. Sure. So um, me, I'm Anissa Woodall. <laughs> I, um, I call myself a, a real food nutritionist um, and a natural mama. <laughs> and really what I what I like to do is, you know, I have the, the goal of helping to inspire and, um, and just encourage women to have more, um, confidence and mm -hmm. intention and motivation behind everything that they're doing in their lives, whether it's, you know, from conscious conception or, you know, in terms of like preparing for pregnancy, going through the pregnancy experience in the postpartum period, then going into parenthood. And so a lot of what I do, especially, you know, right now is, um, you know, I have a, a son who's two and a half years old mm -hmm. and, um, and that has kind of preparing for that life event and, you know, it's a life changing event. Um, mm -hmm. In preparing for that, I, I kind of went, went at it from a, a personal perspective, but also from a professional perspective in like, what is the, you know, best way that I can prepare for this. And, um, and so I did tons of continuing ed, reading tons of books and, you know, just really seeking out everything, um, on how to optimize this experience. And I'm so glad that I did. Mm -hmm. Um, and now, and now, you know, some of the offerings that I'm having, you know, right now I just started a, um, I'm calling it the birthing mama's moon circle where it's a women's oh, circle yeah. where it's, it's kind of an opportunity for people to connect and learn from other women who've had experience or, you know, who are interested in just learning about this. And, um, and so the group that I'm doing right now, it just started, but I'm hoping to maybe do some more in the future, but it's kind of been, um, you know, so there's a whole lot of like everything along the spectrum of supporting women throughout that, that motherhood yeah. transition is kind of what I, what I really, um, am passionate about and, you know, helping them get there and then also helping them, mm -hmm. you know, afterward. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I love that. You know, and I feel like that's kind of part of what's, um, I don't know, missing, you know, that missing link with a lot of women now. And so we'll, we'll dive deep into that. I want to talk more about the moon circle too, because that sounds super exciting. <laughs> Yeah, um, sure. <laughs> so first, let's talk about the fertility piece, because I know that's a big kind of part about your focus. And it sounds like also with the birth of your young son about that kind of like, you know, was your driving passion behind it. And what do you think about um, like, because I know we're having this fertility crisis <laughs> because of, you know, and there's a lot of different aspects, of course, that fall into that. And um, so let's say step one, you're a couple, um, you and your partner, or what, or maybe you're not a couple, maybe just you, <laughs> you'll have to be a couple, but let's say you want, you're thinking about having a baby. So but let's talk about that first step. What's step number one? <laughs> so um, thinking about having a baby, number one, I would say, <laughs> having that thought is, is really the first part, you know, I mean, there are many, there's what we call like a conscious conception. And then there's also an unconscious conception, right? Maybe mm -hmm. some people happen to, Oh no, I'm pregnant. Right. right. And then, not to say one is better than the other. Um, mm -hmm. but one thing I will say is that, um, being like consciously living will help prepare you for a conscious conception mm -hmm. or, or an unconscious conception, right? Like if right. you are already mindful about um, the things you're putting in your body, the things you have in your environment, the thoughts you're having, you know, mm -hmm. like literally everything, uh, you know, when we think about it from a whole body holistic perspective, it's everything is influencing you and the baby, you know, even before it's, it's out of your womb. Right. And so, um, so that I would say is the first, is the first part is just start, seeking to, you know, improve every part of your life. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's kind of, uh, the very first part and, um, you know, but in terms of a woman or a couple who's, who's seeking to prepare their bodies for, for this process, it's, um, depending on where they're starting at, mm -hmm. um, you know, it can take longer to prepare, you know, depending, right. So for right. example, 
um, for a woman who, you know, I would say, I don't know the exact percentage of how many people um, go, go this route, but many people in my generation, especially, and even a little bit older, um, have been on birth control for, you know, since their teenage years, right? right. You know, mm -hmm. they have period problems, they're painful, they're heavy, they have mm -hmm. acne, you know, mm -hmm. list the problem the pillow was the answer. <laughs> right. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we're finding now that there are women who've been on the pill for 10, 15 years mm -hmm. and never had a normal cycle. Right. Um, don't know what normal looks like. And, and so then they're now thinking, okay, I want to start getting pregnant. And I can't tell you how common it is, but I get patients in my office who say, you know, I'm currently on the pill, but I want to start trying to get pregnant soon. I'm thinking about coming off the pill and starting the next month. Right. And it's like, whoa, whoa stop. Yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about this for a second. So, yeah. um, so I think that's one thing that's really um, not shared with women when they go mm -hmm. on this is that, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to say I'm, I'm the expert on the pill, right? I'm, I'm not a doctor, but <laughs> I have done some research around it and, and right. learning. Um, you know, but in terms of the side effects of being on it, especially for a chronic period of time, you know, there's um, interruptions in the gut microbiome, you know, mm -hmm. kind of leaky, leaky gut or intestinal permeability, yep. um, you know, can, can definitely in influence dysbiosis, um, mm -hmm. definitely deplete certain nutrients that, mm, you know, maybe not ironically, like, those are also the nutrients that are essential for fertility, right? right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so those are all kind of things that kind of come in. And, um, you know, oftentimes women are dealing with, you know, various mood disorders as a result. Um, mm -hmm. Because, for example, one nutrient that's commonly depleted on hormonal contraceptives would be vitamin B6. Mm -hmm. And Six is really essential for production of serotonin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so if you're not able to produce serotonin adequately, then depression or anxiety, you know, might be a result. And so, um, so it's really about kind of thinking about it from a, a big picture and saying like, okay, if I'm meeting someone and, you know, trying to help them on their fertility journey, I say, okay, you know, what are the symptoms you're dealing with now? Mm -hmm. And what can that tell us about where we might need to start? Right. So, you know, because if they are experiencing mood disorders, then it could say, okay, we might need to focus on B6 and, you know, several others as well, you know, folate and B12 and right. things like that. But, um, you know, sometimes depending on how quickly someone wants to try to conceive, I might consider doing some testing, you know, micronutrient testing with them mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. or doing some Dutch testing to, mm -hmm. to help get a picture of what their hormonal um, makeup is like. and. Right just how, how everything's working. And then that can help point us in the, in the direction of where, where we need to start. Um, you know, someone else who might not, you know, like myself, I had never been on hormonal contraceptives. And I would say I was kind of the anomaly, like at <laughs> least in terms of the people who I went to high school with and went to college mm -hmm. with, right. It felt like everyone has been on it at one point or another in mm -hmm. their life. Um, but for me, like who had never been on, you know, any kind of hormonal contraceptive, um, I didn't need to do that level of like extensive testing or, you know, preparation, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, you know, I personally, I did switch from a vegetarian diet um, to a more whole foods, nutrient dense diet. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I would say at least five years before I even thought about conceiving. And so right. in that time I was able to kind of make up my, um, my nutrient stores. And I had done some testing just out of curiosity, but, right. <laughs> um, you know, my nutrient levels were definitely, you know, good and healthy, you know, in, in, when it came time to, time to start trying to conceive. <laughs> nice. Oh, good. Okay. So great. So it sounds like step one is just like, you have the thought <laughs> and then, then you're going to lay the foundation, so to speak. So that kind of like those, you know, if you're building your house, you have the like little steps that are starting to form like, okay, this is my step one for making sure all of my environment is ready for even starting to conceive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you talked to, too about um, the cycle picture. So let's talk more uh, in depth about that because I think that's a big key for our listeners today because like you said, 
you know, um, some of them might have been on some type of hormonal uh, contraception, uh, contraceptive for a long period of time. Um, so what are some tips or tools that they can start to use for mapping their cycle out to find out if it is normal, if they don't know, you know, so yeah. how do, how do they know like, well, um, I have a cycle every like 50 days. Is that normal or something like that? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question because, um, there, there is a wide, like, there is a range of normal, right? You know, mm -hmm. and so um, there's kind of a range of what's normal for a, um, you know, a normal period. There's a range of like when one can expect to ovulate. There's a range for how long a cycle can be. And so I would say in general, right, like 25 to 35 days is a good mm -hmm. range of what would be considered normal, um, you know, for a, a whole cycle. Um, I do highly recommend um, women to um, to start practicing a method called we call the fertility awareness method mm -hmm. or FAM. Mm -hmm. um, and what that is, it's it's really about becoming aware of where you are in your fertility. You know, right. kind of <laughs> makes sense. Yes. Um, and so what that involves is charting, kind of you know this is the first day of my cycle mm -hmm. and you know meet. So first day of the cycle is the first day of your period, which oftentimes I think in the language that we use around the cycle, many people think the cycle means the five day period that you're right. waiting. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the cycle is really the full, you know, the first day of your period to the first day of your next period, right? Yeah, that's, exactly. the, that's a whole cycle. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, you know, charting, like the day you start and then how heavy is your flow and mm -hmm. you know, how many days are you bleeding? Are you spotting at all? And what are your symptoms? Right. Mm -hmm. So if, if at all. Right. And so, and then, you know, just logging it and saying, okay, how did you feel? And then, and then I also encourage women to get in touch with what it looks like to ovulate. Right. right. Are they mm -hmm. ovulating mm -hmm. and are they noticing when they ovulate? Right. Many women don't know when they ovulate, and I can't tell you how many women I've seen for fertility preparation mm -hmm. who've already done IUIs, IVF, who don't know their body's own signs of ovulation. Wow. And that's mind blowing to me. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they rely on the OPKs, the ov yeah. uh, ovulation predictor kits or things like that. And, and that's okay to use those modalities. But as women, we have this like really just this privilege right, of this, a gift. You know, mm -hmm. direct biofeedback mechanism mm -hmm. that our body's constantly communicating with us. And, you know, I like to say, if you don't hear the whispers, you're going to hear the screams, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> and so having some, you know, extreme PMS symptoms or, um, you know, anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. or heavy flow or painful periods, right? Mm -hmm. All of those things can be screams from your body saying, hey, right. look at here, there's something to focus on. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and so, um, you know, getting in touch with when, when you're ovulating, I actually have an article on my, um, on my or blog on my website oh, great. Uh, titled, Do You Know When You Ovulate? <laughs> um, and so I kind of go into the details of what that looks like. But in general, mm -hmm. um, you know, identifying, are you producing cervical fluid, right, mm -hmm. or cervical mucus? Mm -hmm. um, and for most women, they will produce cervical mucus if they're, if they're healthy and fertile. Um, for, it varies depending on age, but maybe like right. three to seven days, right, or mm -hmm. two to seven days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a, a patient right now who's 42 and, um, you know, wanting to see if she can get pregnant. She's been trying for five years, you know, has mm. done IVF, has done IUIs. Yeah. Too much with her diet before. And so we don't know if she's going to be able to conceive. She's also kind of in that, um, you know, closer to the post-fertility um, period Where of her life. Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, and so with her, um, she says she produces cervical fluid, you know, one to two times in a, in a cycle. Mm -hmm. And so, or sorry, not one to two times, um, one, one to two, two days. days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, but for someone who's maybe closer to their teen years or in their early 20s, would likely be producing cervical fluid for about seven days mm -hmm. in the cycle, which is just generally why women are considered to be more fertile right. when they're younger, right? It's, yeah. it's not <laughs> like an age thing. It's right. just to produce more cervical fluid. Right. Your body's more w wanting to have a, a child during that period. <laughs> right. And so one of the fascinating things that I like to share about, um, you know, cervical mucus is that it's intentionally designed to trap the sperm mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and to nourish it for the period mm-hmm. that it's in your body. Mm-hmm. So for example, um, you can be producing cervical mucus three days before the day that you ovulate. But if you have intercourse, mm-hmm. you know, three days before you ovulate, right. that, that cervical mucus is, is literally sticky, right? Like right. you should be able to stretch it. And it's mm-hmm. very fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually <laughs> ovulating right now. And I was trying- <laughs> <laughs> you know, who's, a, who's also a naturopath. And so right. kind of, I was like, do you want to see my cervical mucus? <laughs> and so I was like literally stretching it for him. Like, wow, that's like hyaluronic acid. <laughs> it's so cool. I love it. And so, but you know, it, it's very physically sticky, so it can trap the sperm and then it nourishes it. You know, it, it has that nutrition in there mm-hmm. to help that sperm to survive for up to five days in the, right. in the body, which is which pretty is so amazing. amazing. Yeah. So amazing. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so, so it's really, it's the body's, you know, evolutionary way of saying like, we want to make sure that you can mm-hmm. reproduce. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the so likelihood, you know, the exact day, right. So yeah. we, everything is primed for that. Yeah. <laughs> and so then when you, I would say the day after um, your, your, what we call peak cervical mucus day, you know, mm-hmm. if the next day when you're dry, that would then indicate that you ovulated. Right. And so, so then that can be a really helpful way to not only, um, time, you know, time your intercourse, if you're trying mm-hmm. to get pregnant, but could also be really helpful if you're trying not to get pregnant, right? right. If, yeah, you, if you're producing cervical <laughs> mucus, right? You know, like for example, with us right now, um, we're planning to try to conceive soon, but we're not quite ready yet. Well, yeah. uh, I'm very ready. <laughs> Both parties but, need to be ready, right? <laughs> um, you know, but, you know, and so that then means that if you're ovulating and you want to have intercourse, then it might mean either, you know, using a condom or, you know, whatever other like method Method. that you prefer Mm -hmm. to like minimize the sperm getting into the body. Right. right? Yeah. Um, you know, but then, you know, some people, I would say the, the most, if we're to use for the fertility awareness method as a form of contraception, Mm -hmm. then it's really like the research shows that like complete abstinence during the time that you're producing cervical mucus will Mm -hmm. produce the best effects. Right. So, um, you know, but, if, so then the next day would be the dry day. That would then mean you're, mm-hmm. you know, you've ovulated and understanding ovulation can also help you predict your next period, right? right. So um, that second half of the cycle, which is what we call the luteal phase, mm-hmm. that cycle or that phase of the cycle is much more predictable, meaning, yeah. um, you know, each person has their own tendency for how long their luteal phase tends to be. And, mm-hmm. you know, if it's too short, that can lead to, um, you know, potential, in, you know, infertility or miscarriage right. because the what we the endometrium doesn't have enough time to thicken, right? right. And mm-hmm. right, and you know, in some research shows that I, I believe it's like if it's seven millimeters or less, or if it's less than seven millimeters, the likelihood that you will have a full term pregnancy is a lot lower. Yeah, um, and so it's really just the thickness you know, that, and so, so important. it's that time that's needed for that to, for that to develop. And, um, you know, I would say a normal kind of luteal phase would be, um, you know, around like 12 to right. 15 days yep. in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so when someone, if they have a late period, understanding when you're ovulating can be really helpful mm-hmm. to know, are you pregnant? Yeah. Is it just, you know, something else, right? So for example, if your follicular phase, the first half of your cycle, Mm -hmm. maybe you were really stressed, or maybe, um, you know, maybe you had been fasting more than you were previously, Mm -hmm. or you, you know, traveling or moving or exercise a lot (laughs) or any kind of stressor on the body that can delay ovulation Mm -hmm. and make it so that maybe if you're used to ovulating around day 15 or 14, you know, you might be ovulating around day 21. And you could think that you're pregnant and, or, you know, if you're trying to conceive, you might not even be having sex on the right day because right. you ovulated <laughs> exactly. later, right? So mm-hmm. there's so many important reasons to, to know when you're ovulating so that you can then predict your next period, know if you're pregnant, you know, right. all of those things. And so um, I feel like it's a very empowering tool to, mm. to be in charge of your fertility, right? Like right. I'm choosing to get <laughs> pregnant or to not get pregnant or to right. like know when I'm starting my period or all of those things. So yeah. there's a whole lot of reasons why it can be, why it can be really important. But 
I wanted to share, um, I brought it over here, but I wanted okay, to share sure. a tool that I like to use for oh, charting great. my fertility. So for yeah. people who are watching the video, you can yeah, see perfect. this. Um, and this is called the menstrual calendar journal. Ooh, that's beautiful. Look at that. <laughs> oh, it's gorgeous. And there's very beautiful illustrations in it. Um, and it's made by, um, you can get it at kapu.community. So K-A-P-U dot community. Okay, we'll um, put this all in the show notes too for those of you that uh, need to find out where to buy it. <laughs> yeah, and so, but if you look at it, it's, oh, I wow, love it because it's a, it's a circular calendar. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, um, it had, you can put the, put the, uh, the month and then you can write like the days of your cycle. You can write the days that you were bleeding, um, the days that you might've done some vaginal steaming or the right. days that you were producing cervical mucus or whatever. And then yeah. there's also, um, pages for where you can do your, um, your temperature tracking if you would like. Great. And there's also herbal, herbal recommendations and things right. like that. So, oh, that but I really, super. Yeah, I really love using that because, mm -hmm. you know, I never really resonated with tracking it on an app. Mm -hmm. um, it always, I always felt kind of disconnected from, from my cycle in that way. And there's lots of great apps to use if, if right. you feel like that way is effective for you. Um, but many of the apps also try to predict your fertility. And right, yeah, they do. <laughs> kind of, it um, doesn't necessarily encourage you to get in tune with your own body. Mm -hmm. um, and so having that kind of circular, um, format it can be really helpful and then also another thing that they have with this is um you know they provide like a lunar calendar oh, and so you can great. write on there where yeah. you you know where the full moon is where the new moon is right and, so important know, then like being mindful of where you're at in the moon cycle mm -hmm. and then there's also this um maybe I'll put it like this Ugh. so you kind of line it up here. Oh, okay, cool. So, so the moon uh, with your cycle and a little, it's like well, a little, um, for those of the listeners that aren't watching the video, it's like a little colored disc with the yeah. different phases of the moon. Is that what it is? So the colored disc is actually um, the seasons. So oh, the seasons. spring, oh. summer, fall, and winter. And it mm -hmm. also talks about the different characteristics in part of your cycle that you might want to be doing. So for example, right now we're doing this podcast while I'm ovulating, which is right. good timing for me. <laughs> right, yeah, <okay. laughs> because when you're ovulating, you tend to be more, um, you know, like, so here it, is, it shows in summertime. So you tend to be more playful, relationship building, mm -hmm. having extroverted tendencies, co better communication skills. Mm -hmm. And so like being mindful of your cycle can yeah. help where like, okay, where do I want to schedule things in my calendar that where I'm going to be my optimal person, right? You might yeah. not want to be <laughs> doing things where you're trying to be social and connected when you're like menstruating. Cause all you want to do is like be inside and cuddled up and not talk <laughs> right. to anybody. <laughs> right. Totally. Watch movies, eat chocolate. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Wow. So that sounds like there, I, I love that book. Thank you for that tool. You know, and there, like you said, there are apps, but I love the, the, the more personal connection because then, and also I think, um, it, using that kind of written tool just to me, it's a different part of our brain, right? So exactly. it's more, more, um, connection. And so, uh, you talked about too, so the different kind of like tracking your cycle and the different aspects of the cycle, which was great. And then what do you, what are some recommendations from that um, nutrition point of view that can help improve your cycle? If say you're, um, for instance, you know, during, maybe you're having too long of a cycle or you're having heavy bleeding. Are there some nutrition tips? I know those are two different things, but we can talk about more, but specific nutrition tips um, for having a healthier cycle to prepare for conception. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, some of some of the symptoms can help to determine wh where things might be going wrong. So, for example, mm -hmm. if you're having heavy bleeding, that can maybe indicate some estrogen dominance, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so then identifying, obviously, we could take it from a, you know, based on the symptoms, we might want to do this or do some hormonal testing and confirm right. that, right? Like you mentioned the um, touch test earlier. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. And so, um, so then kind of, saying, okay, well, if somebody is dealing with estrogen dominance type symptoms, then we want to do things that help to promote better regulation of estrogen, right? Mm -hmm. And so part of that's going to really be focusing on gut health, right? Mm -hmm. Because exactly. um, I would say gut health and liver detox support, mm -hmm. um, both because um, 
you want to make sure that you're eliminating the estrogen that you are metabolizing, right? A lot of times, right. say for example, if somebody is dealing with some constipation, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, slower gut motility, the estrogen that they do metabolize and excrete out of their liver goes into their gut, but they're going to reabsorb it if it's not going anywhere. Right. <laughs> yeah, if it's not being and, eliminated, we reabsorb it, right? <laughs> right. And so there are certain things that we can do, you know, certain supplements, you know, it might be, um, you know, something like DIM or calcium deglucurate that can right. help to um, regulate that estrogen metabolism. But it's the specific, specific like foods or, you know, nutrients that I would mm -hmm. talk about would be, um, you know, one of the first one that comes to mind would be kind of the brassica family, right? right. So, and what, um, what's that family for our listeners? <laughs> yeah. So broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, Yum. kale, collards, mustard, mm -hmm. you know, all of those, um, you know, broccoli family foods right. are, and I would say maybe the, at the top of it would be like broccoli sprouts, which are very oh, high so in good. sulforaphane yeah. and, um, you know, which really promotes that, that liver detoxification. Um, and so that would be one, you know, one of the challenges around that though, is that for people who might have some gut dysbiosis, they might not digest those foods very well. <laughs> right. right? And, so, <laughs> and so then that would then indicate, okay, if you don't digest those foods very well, there's something else that's going on. Right. right so exactly. then figuring out how do we create more, more microbial balance. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that um, you know, disruptions in the gut microbiome can happen as a result of the pill. So if right. somebody's on the pill, you know, and then dealing with, you know, whether it's constipation or diarrhea or gas or bloating, mm -hmm. you know, that can then indicate, hmm, maybe let's start there, right? And so yeah. um, there might be certain nutrients or certain food that, that we might want to, that we might want to focus on. But to answer your question about like, which nutrients do we really want to focus on, um, you know, one of the ones that is commonly depleted, um, both on birth control, but also in many people in general would be magnesium, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. magnesium, um, you know, some research shows that 50% of the American population is deficient in magnesium. Know, isn't that crazy? It's so crazy. Right. <laughs> and that's why I think, you know, that's why so many women crave chocolate <laughs> yeah, <laughs> around that time of their month, right? <laughs> right because yeah. cacao is a very good source of magnesium. And so now I'm not saying eat all the chocolate, but um, <laughs> by all means have some, right. uh, you know, but there, I love, you know, encouraging women to have, um, you know, some cacao powder and like making it yeah. like a bittersweet hot chocolate or, mm -hmm. um, you know, or mixing it into like an avocado kind of mousse or something yeah, like that. Um, that sounds good. And so, or having cacao nibs, right. Or, mm -hmm. or even if you're not wanting to do just chocolate, you know, maybe having some dark leafy greens, right. Those yeah. are all going to be high in magnesium or, you know, spirulina high in chlorophyll. And so mm -hmm. all of those are going to be great sources of magnesium to help not only, especially, you know, during the menstruation to help with, you know, the muscle contractions of, you know, minimizing the cramping, right. There is evidence to show that supplementation of magnesium during menstruation can help to totally. um, minimize, minimize cramping and mm -hmm. pain. Um, you know, but I would say for so many different reasons, right? Like magnesium is used in hundreds of <laughs> enzymes in the body. Yeah. Um, and so, great you know, factor. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's one of the key nutrients that I, that I definitely recommend. Another one would be, um, you know, what I refer to as bioavailable um, folate, right? Mm -hmm, so right. many people have heard of it as folic acid, yep. which that's kind of the synthetic form of the vitamin. And some people can utilize that in, in that form. But there are also many people who might have, you know, um, more severe or less severe forms of a genetic variation of, right. you know, certain en or certain um, yeah, enzymes. So for example, like the commonly referred to MTHFR enzyme. Yeah, totally. And, and so um, we like to call that the mother effort. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, Which can cause a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and so, you know, for example, myself, like I do have, um, you know, the lesser version of that, mm -hmm. that um, genetic variation, but um, that means that I, I do need to be really mindful about getting bioavailable forms of folate in my mm -hmm. diet. So that could mean getting a methylfolate uh, or, you know, methylated folate supplement, right. or it could mean getting, you know, food, food-based forms of folate. So um, the best source is going to be from, from liver, uh, any yeah. kind of liver, <laughs> my favorite. <Yeah. laughs> and, um, 
and you know, or dark leafy greens are also, right. or, or some legumes as well can be a great yeah. source of folate. So, um, so those, those are kind of the top two nutrients that come to yeah, mind. That's perfect. Um, and, and one of the reasons why folate is really important in the, um, especially in the mm -hmm. fertility period and, and preconception period is because you really need to make sure you have enough of it. Um, yeah. and choline as well, right? They kind of right. work together in terms of how and they work in the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, but they're really important because they're really, they're working throughout the whole pregnancy in terms of mm -hmm. developing an embryo, but a lot of the work that they do are, you know, is really important in that first month of pregnancy when most people don't even know that they're pregnant. Right. So, they're like, oh, I'm pregnant. <laughs> right. Right. And so, and that's where, um, you know, m some women, they might come off of birth control and they can get pregnant right away. Right. You know, that's okay, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Right. And so I definitely encourage a period of preparing the body, making mm -hmm. sure you have those nutrient stores so that when you go into it, you then can go into it with, um, you know, not at a deficit, right? right. Like, On the um, side. <laughs> right. And so, you know, I all, I like to, you know, many people will say, you know, oh, I just want to have a healthy baby. That's all that matters. And mm -hmm. it's like, well, no, that's not all that matters. Right. <laughs> what about you? You, you matter too. <laughs> right. And so, you know, it could mean, you know, if you want to have an easier conception, if you want to have a more enjoyable pregnancy, a, easier labor, you know, more easier labor, enjoyable birth, you know, mm -hmm. easy breastfeeding, you know, or, you know <laughs> right. Like mm -hmm. postpartum, you know, lack of postpartum mood disorders. And so there's, there's this whole spectrum of, um, you know, conditions that happen mm -hmm. because women are going into this event at a deficit. And so right. it's like, yes, having a healthy baby is important, but that shouldn't be our only standard. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's, let's no. talk about the one, the, the mother, cause she's really important too. And the other partner, right. And that right. Partner right. Too. Um, yeah. One thing you said about the broccoli sprouts, this sounds so yummy. Um, they are pretty easy to grow at home, right? You can just grow them in a little, get the seeds and then sprout them yourself. Yeah. So you can get some broccoli sprouting seeds. I get mine off of mountain rose herbs mm -hmm. and, um, and you can get, there's different ways to do sprouting. Um, the one that I like to do is, um, it's like a, it's kind of like a mesh strainer on, right. you know, lid. a screw top <laughs> lid on a, on a mason jar. And mm -hmm. then you can just, it has these little lips where you can turn, you know, you rinse them twice a day and then you turn it upside down to let the water drain out. Yeah. And with sprouts, like you do have to be mindful of like rinsing them, you know, at least twice a day so that they don't start to develop mold or things right. like that. Don't um, need that. <laughs> but I do love, there's a great video on YouTube um, with Tom Maltair, who's another nutritionist mm -hmm. um, uh, of whole life nutrition. And he oh, does yeah. a great like kind of tutorial on how to do it. It's very easy. Um, nice. It's Perfect. And I really like to just do it. I keep it by my sink so that when I, you know, am washing dishes from breakfast or from dinner, mm -hmm. I just like, oh, let me just rinse these real quick, dump it. And then I just put it right back there. Yeah. So Oh, um, that's true. That sounds so easy to do. What a great way to bring in some healthy bioavailable folate into the yeah. system. <laughs> yeah. And it's, you know, I like to sprinkle them on salads or I'll just put them on eggs or have them by themselves. Right. Like right, little snack. <laughs> <laughs> you can think about, you know, if it's food is medicine, like, right, okay, exactly. instead of taking these supplements with a drink, like, let me just grab a handful of breast or broccoli sprouts and just eat those. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, so it sounds like it's really important to have this whole um, kind of idea, which we've talked about coming into the preconception time period. And of course, not everyone has it planned, like you said. <laughs> right. um, and do you recommend, okay, say someone's coming in to see you and um, do you recommend like a brief period of time for a detox program? Um, and what would that look like for a patient coming to see you? Yeah. Um, so I definitely like to start with you know, checking in with the person, seeing what their lifestyle is like, um, if, if they might have increased exposure, you know, mm -hmm. so like environmental so, toxicants or something like that. Yeah. So, you know, common things that I think about is like, how often are they getting their nails done? You know, do mm -hmm. they work in a nail or a hair salon, right? Mm -hmm. Where they're constantly exposed to chemicals, mm -hmm. um, you know, or, if they're, if they use kind of more mainstream products in their home. Mm -hmm. So how, you know, house cleaning agents or, you know, skincare 
cosmetics, right. you know, all of those things, right? If they're using more of the mainstream stuff, the likelihood is that they do need to do some form of detox mm -hmm. to help promote that. Because, yeah. um, you know, if you think about it like a bucket, right, you have this bucket of um, different factors that are influencing your body's mm -hmm. fertility, right? And right. you might have like, okay, stress is in the bucket, or you might have um, I mean, stress, that's a whole umbrella term, right? right Could be right. emotional stress, work stress, <laughs> yeah. life stress, right? All of those yes. things. Um, Some you know, stress disturbance. Exercise. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> um, you know, and then uh, it could be having, you know, maybe you paint your nails frequently. Maybe you dye your hair a lot or maybe, mm -hmm. you, you know, do this and that. Live in a big city. Or <laughs> right. Live in a big city. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there's all these different things to consider. And then like, I'm not going to say treating one of those is going to fix the entire problem, right? right. It's about <laughs> minimizing how full that bucket is. Exactly. <laughs> and, so, and that's where it's, you know, that's why some of the research on healthy, um, healthy diets, especially can be so challenging because it's like, well, which one was it? Right. right. <laughs> yes. There's you know? a lot of factors that go into that. Right. <laughs> right. And so, you know, um, especially coming from a, um, a vegetarian background, you know, mm -hmm. there was, there was often the argument of like, well, meat's bad for you. And then there's, there's right. the other part was like, well, really it might be like sugar and like all of this. And so, <laughs> right. and you know, the research is so, so challenging to do because it's so expensive to a hundred percent control everybody's diet and like, what's the recall bias and right. all of that. So that's a little bit of a tangent, but yeah. Um, in terms of, you know, doing some detox. So I think, you know, addressing people's environmental um, mm -hmm. exposures, you know, mm -hmm. so addressing it from a, um, a preventative kind of way in terms of minimizing how many toxins you have to um, metabolize. And then right. I like to take the stance of supporting the body's own detoxification mm -hmm. mechanisms, right? So right. like the liver you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, and that might mean doing some form of a, um, you know, a detox, meaning like right. supplementation or like specific foods, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. like I mentioned, I'm a real food nutritionist. So I definitely right. prefer using foods first and then yes. using supplements to kind of fill in the gaps or fine tune certain things, right? Like or I mentioned, start if, something. <laughs> right. If somebody is dealing with estrogen dominance or maybe they have high testosterone, right? There might be different things that we might be doing to help regulate those specific hormones in, mm -hmm. you know, in particular. And so, right. um, you know, blood sugar balancing is a really important factor in yeah. that. Right. And so mm -hmm. it's not always going to be like, take this magic pill and like right. you're detoxed. It's right. no. <laughs> address all of these different. things. <laughs> yeah. And there are some supplements that can definitely <laughs> help with that. Right. Um, you know, but I definitely like to, to go from a more individualized perspective and seeing like, is this person dealing with gut problems, you know, or right other symptoms and like migraines or whatever, and yeah. then helping that to inform what direction to go in. And there's certain things that we can then do to help them optimize detoxification and then considering what their genetics might be. Right. You right. Know? Exactly. Gen and so profile and, and how they're feeling. And yeah, so it sounds very individualized, but then there's right. different, different aspects that you can use depending on the particular patient coming in. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Um, okay. Perfect. And so that would be something that they could, they would check in with you in the beginning. Like they're, okay, I'm thinking about, or we're, me and my partner or whatever, we're thinking about having a, a, a baby. And so you're like, okay, step one, we've looked at, you know, have you been using some kind of uh, contraception? Ding. Right. We're going we're gonna to work on that. And then step two, what's your environment looking like? How, what's your exposure been? What's your, how's your lifestyle? Sounds like with the stress factors. Yeah. Um, and also probably like, what's your diet like? Um, what, yeah. you, what kind of specific foods have you been eating? Um, and then looking at a whole big picture and coming together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so one thing I will mention though, that um, for some people who are, you know, coming off of the pill and thinking about getting pregnant, um, you know, many of the experts recommend 18 months to two years to allow that mm -hmm. menstrual regularity to come back to, to you know, replete nutrients. And like, yeah. I might, you know, I'm not going to say that it's going to take that long for everyone. Um, right. That's kind of the general recommendation of like how to get back into right. to full balance, balancing. Mm -hmm. right? But, um, you know, again, that's going to be individualized, right? Some people might have right. better detox genetics than other people, right? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and so I, you know, I definitely recommend at least six months um, mm -hmm. up to 18 months to allow that menstrual regularity to come back. And, and you know, like I mentioned, that menstrual cycle is a biofeedback, right? The right. more normal that gets, the more that indicates your, your fertility. And so, mm -hmm. um, 
that's why like in my fertility nutrition coaching that I mm -hmm. offer, you know, it's a six month package, right? And right. so it's kind of intended to be that six month preparation period where you really nourish the body and like understand what, what you need to do to replete those nutrients. And mm -hmm. if we think about it, right, like the amount of time it takes for um, an egg to be released, right? So when you're ovulating, you're releasing an egg to then be fertilized. Um, it takes about three to four months for that egg to be prepared for release. And so right. the lifestyle habits, the, you know, the mm. diet, the stress, the thoughts, all of those things that are happening three to four months before right. you actually conception is so important. <laughs> are the in, are the epigenetic influences on mm the egg that then is released. Right. right. And so, um, so that's why I like, I'm so passionate about like mm -hmm. helping support people at this time, because it's yeah. like, you know, um, when we, when we talk about optimizing genetics, I don't, I don't want it to be like a, um, you know, there's kind of like that eugenics type of, um, right. yeah. <laughs> concept, but I, it's, perfect. Not, <laughs> right. it's not about, it's not about perfection. It's not right. about like, you know, these are the best genes or whatever. <laughs> it's about like taking the, you know, the genetic blueprint from the father or, you know, partner, and then taking the genetic blueprint from the mother. And then like, how can you, you provide the opportunity for those genes to like, for the best genes of those two people to be passed on right. for the offspring. Right. Yeah. And, and that's where the diet and lifestyle can be so important. So like, mm -hmm. for example, um, women who experience gestational diabetes in pregnancy, right, which is a huge one. They had like the high blood sugar environment in, you know, in utero for the baby directly impact impacts their likelihood of getting diabetes mm -hmm. later on in life. Right. right? And so, you know, many of them get it in childhood if the just, mm. if the gestational diabetes is not well managed. Right. right. And so that's where I really like to help support people as well is in managing blood sugar during pregnancy, but yeah. especially before that, right? right. Like, <laughs> you know, we know like some research shows that, um, checking your, uh, first trimester A1C, you know, if it's above a certain level, it can be like 98% predictive of gestational diabetes wow. and gestational it's diabetes actually tool. gets diagnosed in the third trimester. So it's right. like, why not diagnose it in the beginning <laughs> or at least just check blood sugar and see where it's at right. so that we can then have the entire pregnancy to optimize the, the, you know, the baby's. Exactly. Trip. Right. Yeah. You have, do have nine months. <laughs> you may, well, not always. <laughs> because sometimes you don't know right away, but yes. Yeah. yeah I had time, 10 months. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you know, sometimes you don't. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Great. Yeah. I think, you know, that's, um, such a key part in all of that together. And I wanted to also ask you, so do you work, you know, you're talking about working a lot with like the, the mom, the ask that aspect, do you work with partners together? Cause I, you know, I think that that relationship, you know, and as you're talking about too, with that preconception piece, if the partners aren't eating well together, I mean, the sperm is a huge part of yes. <laughs> conception. <laughs> Yes. And so usually the recommendations, so you probably know this from your own practice, but the likelihood for women to seek out medical care, um, is much higher than men right. to seek out. <laughs> exactly. So, um, and so I would just say like, generally the recommendations I give for the women that I work with also pertain to the husbands mm, right. of the partners. And right. so, um, you know, the bottom line is, the oxidative stress, the nutrient status of the, the, the uh, partner is just as important, right? right you know, exactly. obviously it's not going to be as directly influencing during the pregnancy time, mm -hmm. right? But in that preconception period, right? Like he's going to be giving on his genetics as well. And so, right. <laughs> um, and so one of the areas that I really like to focus on with when I'm working with men is, um, you know, really supporting, minimizing oxidative stress, minimizing, um, you know, things that influence DNA damage. So like, for example, mm -hmm. my husband is no longer using the sauna, <laughs> you know, because like, like okay, excess heat, right. right. And so, you know, excess heat, uh, you know, exposed to the sperm or the, you know, the testicles, um, you know, can be, can be potentially cause, causing right. DNA damage. And sperm so, count. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and then focusing on certain foods that then help to influence sperm quality and, and different things like that. Right. Um, you know, something that I, that I will also focus on with men. Um, oh, nice. That's great. I also find that, um, you know, I work primarily with women and, mm -hmm. and I, I love working with men as well. But one of the things I find is 
when I'm working with women, there always seems to kind of be this, um, it's always more challenging for women to make dietary change because there's a much more like emotional tie with food mm. for, for one. Just this, this is just my observation. I'm not saying like as a generalized, like every woman is like this, right. but <laughs> Boy, in, my, in, practice. <laughs> in my experience, anytime I make a recommendation for men, it's mm -hmm. like they, they visit with me once I tell them what to do. They go home, they do it. They come back. They're like, okay, I met my goal. <laughs> Right. You know, it's very it's different mentality sometimes. Oh, like, too. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so I like, it's kind of for that reason that I don't focus as much with men because it's like, well, if you're doing what you're, what, what your partner's doing, then mm -hmm. you're probably fine. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, but there's also like a huge, like stress piece as well. Right. And right. so, you know, that's, that's one area that I do, um, really like to, to check in with, with, um, men to make sure that they're not like overly stressed. Right. And, right. and things like that, just in terms of depleting nutrients and also just hormones and things like that. Right. Making sure that both, both sides of the party are balanced. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. That's great. So it looks like the, um, from a partner perspective, cause we can you know, be like we said, it could be a single um, woman trying, wanting to conceive, which is totally doable and possible. And we can have, you know, two women coming together. We can have two men coming together. We can have a man and a woman. Like there's so many different combinations right now that we have a different age that we're living in, which is amazing. So it sounds yeah. like there's a lot of different um, aspects that can go into it from that nutritional perspective, but just making sure that one person is kind of on the, the main player on the team and then bringing the other person in. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, what do you think about, so, okay, we're in this uh, quarantine aspect right now and which, you know, has its pluses and minuses from stress. <laughs> we're seeing some people are, you know, having more time on their hands and maybe we're going to see more <laughs> babies happening from this time period, which is true. Um, the quarantiners, I think is what they're being called. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I, I thought, it was, I, I think I saw something, um, it was like, like hashtag pandemic baby. <laughs> right. Yeah, totally. So it's interesting, you know, so, um, maybe some I'm looking for our listeners for some advice about this time period. So say you're like, you're um, having a lot more time at home right now. You're like, okay, maybe this would be a good time for us to talk about conception and yeah. to think about having a baby because we're not going to be working for a while. So this is a really key time to bring in some of those aspects. It sounds like you were talking about, and maybe <laughs> even more from that stress and lifestyle perspective and seeking you out for, for more guidance. If they're, um, feeling more stressed out during this time. Yeah. So one of the things that I definitely think about, um, with the people who are trying to conceive right now is yes, that stress factor, um, for sure. But then also, um, you know, many people they're, they're kind of taking the shelter in place orders or stay at home orders as like a literally stay inside the home. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, environment. <laughs> right. And so, you know, Nature is just, you know, I'm a big believer in naturopathic medicine, right? right you know, yeah, nature so is medicine. Right, exactly. <laughs> so encouraging people to get outside, right? Like, you mm -hmm. know, we're finding, or, you know, some of the research is showing that vitamin D can play a role in terms of, yeah. you know, um, you know, obviously supporting immunity in general, but potentially with, with COVID as well. And so, um, so it's like, not only take a supplement, but like get outside. Like right now right. we're in the time period where depending on where you live in the world, right? Like mm -hmm. finally we can start getting some vitamin D from the sun. Right. Yes. <laughs> and, and so there's, there's that part. Right. But then there's also, um, you know, like the movement and the regulation of stress and like, mm -hmm. there's so much, so many benefits to being outside. It's like hard to really yeah. pinpoint exactly. Know, which right. part. Just makes you feel good. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, but then, Another one that, that really comes to mind is, um, you know, with the stress of it all and, you know, imagining like families are at home, their kids are now home from school, right. maybe the parents are still tr working from home. Yeah, full doing time. like two jobs at home. <laughs> right. And so um, if they're not used to like homeschooling their kids, it's, a, right. it's quite a new balance. And so um, I'm definitely seeing like conversations happening online or in headlines or things like that, you know, people saying like, oh, it's okay to start drinking early in the day, or it's okay to like, you know, use food for comfort to help deal with your stress. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there's like some level of truth to like, 
yes, you do need to manage your stress have an and outlet. <laughs> you have an outlet, right? But but there's also like the, I think it's normalizing the unhealthy eating behaviors and right. drinking behaviors at 10 a.m., yeah. you know, like, right. yeah. um, which directly can impact fertility as well, right? And so, yeah, exactly. you know, I think one of the things that um, sometimes when we start focusing on certain systems of the body, we forget the rest of the body, right? And so the things that are going to help with immunity <laughs> are also going to help with fertility. Right, yes, so like, they're connected. <laughs> it's, not like, it's not like, okay, I'm trying to build my immune system, but oh no, like I'm becoming infertile at the same, you know, like right. that's, the body is smart. Like yeah. <laughs> the thing Thank that God. promotes each system is going to benefit the other systems right. as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and stress plays such a big factor in all that with immunity and um, fertility. <laughs> right, and so, you know, but in terms of thinking about like, with sugar in particular, like mm -hmm. that has a direct influence on our ability to, um, you know, to have balanced hormones, you know, whether it's like sex hormones or thyroid hormone or, you know, insulin and, and that's an influence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so like, I would say one of my top recommendations for people during this time would be to really try and balance blood sugar as much as possible. Right. And that doesn't mean not having any like enjoyable treats or things like right. that. It's like healthy okay, cookies or something like that. Right. Like finding ways to make them a little bit more blood sugar balancing. Right. right. You know, like adding protein to them or adding some yeah. nuts and seeds or something mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, whether it's like protein, fat or fiber, those are the three things that are going to help mm -hmm. to promote better balanced blood sugar. And so right finding ways to increase those things and then minimize, especially the refined carbs. Like we have a neighbor who's friends with somebody who owns like a, the local like Lay's chip company or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they said that um, apparently chip sales have increased like 200% or something. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> and I mean, maybe part of it, they're saying at the grocery store. So maybe part of it's that like some of the other stores are closed, but right. um you know, they're saying it's like the Super Bowl every day is, is, wow, that's is how they explained it. And it's like, yeah. yeah, people are stressed. They're at home. They're in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. They're like, what can I munch on? And right. well, it's, you know, it's like, dopamine. you know, it's like, we just can't stop it. <laughs> right. Right. And so, um, so, and that's kind of why I'm actually considering, like I normally will host, um, it was, pre I was previously doing the 21 day sugar detox uh, mm -hmm. coaching groups, but yeah. you know, I've recently um, kind of rebranded it to 21 day real food reset. And oh, nice. That's I'm, great. I'm seriously considering holding another group like in the next couple of months, because it's like, gosh, people really need this. They're like yeah, stuck they at do. home. They don't know how to control their, right. you know, their stress and like how that then influences what they're choosing to eat. And mm -hmm. especially if they want to maintain their immunity and <laughs> the fertility, right. so anyway, that's like something that's really kind of been on my mind. It's like, gosh, like I need to like help people like with these strategies. <laughs> yeah, totally. You do. And you know, they don't have their work buddy. You know, a lot of us go to work. Um, and they're, you know, like, oh, okay, um, what did you have for dinner last night? You know, that right. partner says, oh, well, maybe you could try adding some kale or something like that, you know, yeah. or help somebody at work. And some of us might not be connecting with those people as much. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Um, so that's great. Let's talk, I wanted to talk about your, um, the exercise piece in pregnancy and preconception. We talked a little bit about it, but I know you're such an expert with the exercise science piece that I thought it would be good to, to, to for our listeners to, you know, um, talk about ways to bring in different parts of exercise and is it healthy to continue exercising during pregnancy? I mean, of course that's individualized, but can you, can you continue your current routine that you're on? Um, should you increase specific things? Are there certain exercises that can help and et cetera? <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, so in terms of exercise in the preconception period, um, you know, it is going to be individualized in terms of what somebody's like, threshold is for, right. you know, <laughs> exercise intensity, um, and experience as well. Um, you know, like for example, I was doing heavy weightlifting throughout my entire pregnancy, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't recommend somebody start doing heavy weightlifting <laughs> okay. when they're pregnant. Right. You're doing it before. <laughs> right. And so kind of the general recommendation is like, whatever you were doing before pregnancy, like is generally okay to do in pregnancy, as long as it feels good. Right. Or, but what if you weren't exercising? <laughs> oh, if you weren't exercising, then I would say, you know, doing things that feel good. That still feel good. <laughs> you know, 
that keep your body moving, right? So mm -hmm. I think the word exor exercise kind of has this like negative connotation behind it where it's right. like oh, it's something I have to do to punish myself, right? Yeah. And and that's that's not it at all. It's how do you keep your body moving? And right. that can be going for a walk, that can be doing stretching, that can be, right. you know, doing, especially if you're pregnant, right? Doing um, kind of like, more like core stability, uh, mm. you know, light squatting, you know, yeah. anything that's going to help to support your, like the changing body that you're having, right? right? Like, exactly. I can't tell you how thankful I was that I continued to move my body and mm. like actually use my muscles throughout pregnancy. Because when I was in labor, like there were times where I was in a deep <laughs> squat for an hour, oh <laughs> two hours, you know, and it <laughs> literally felt like my recovery after birth was, it was like, I just ran a marathon. Right. Yeah, and, totally. Uh, you know, both in terms of like the, the cardio output, but then also the, um, you know, the muscular strength that was needed yeah. to be able to withstand and like, you know, there's a lot of force moving through your body, right? And a lot that's of where, endurance. <laughs> you know, I mean, the uterus is doing much of that exertion, right? Yeah. And that's why you know, the uterus is the strongest muscle in the body uh, right. in a woman, um, which, you know, raspberry leaf tea is a wonderful way to yeah. help support that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but um, I definitely encourage women to, you know, to stay within a, a generally comfortable range. It's okay to, to push yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that you're training for birth, right? And right. I and I definitely um, I, I see it as that. And so one of the things that I did actually um, in my preparation for mm -hmm. labor was I would uh, I did this both with cold temperatures as well as with um, uh, I did this on a stationary bike, but you can kind of do it in any way that feels comfortable. Yeah. But essentially going in intervals. Uh, that you would expect to have in labor. So for oh, example, going for, and this, I don't think there's any research on this, but this was just my own intuition that was like, hey, right. it's like this makes sense. Yeah, you're like, I'll try um, and see what happens. <laughs> and so it was really like, you know, I would go for, you know, maybe 45 to 90 seconds, depending. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, in reality, I should have gone for three minutes because <laughs> I, my contractions lasted for three minutes right. long. Right, you're like, okay, for the next one, I'll do a little different training. <laughs> uh, you know, but so kind of thinking about it like that, so I would I would go on a stationary bike and I would mm -hmm. go for, you know, 60 seconds to 90 seconds as like, as hard as I could, you know, yeah. like really like getting that cardio output, getting that, getting that, um, that muscular like interaction, right? And we have a... Um, it's called an airdyne. It's like one of those, mm -hmm. or like an assault bike where you can right. like, you, yeah. you have the handles and you're riding the bike at the <laughs> right. same time. It's a full body exercise. <laughs> that sounds um, great. And so obviously like not going so much where you're going to have to throw up, right? Like right. you don't want to push yourself that hard. And there's actually a great um, measure of it. Uh, there's a, uh, to be a little bit more objective with it. You know, previously there was, there was a recommendation of like stay beneath this heart rate level and right. that's no longer supported. <laughs> Uh, with the evidence, but the better way of measuring it is by going by rate of perceived exertion. So mm -hmm. RPE, right. And that it's kind of like a zero to 20 scale. And so I would say staying within like, depending on how far along and how, where you're feeling in the moment, right? Yeah. Like always check in with yourself before starting <laughs> a workout. But, um, you know, I would say anywhere from like the 14 to 17, um, rate of perceived exertion is right. a healthy, like normal area to challenge yourself with exercise. Right. And that's, it's going to be very individualized. Right. So of course. if you see 20 as like, oh my gosh, I'm like, I can't breathe. I'm going to throw up. Right. Like don't push yourself that far <laughs> beyond that. Right. Yeah. Not too much, <laughs> you know? And so that doesn't mean you can't challenge yourself, mm -hmm. but like it, you know, cause exercises, you know, I see it as one of the most direct ways you can train for, for labor and birth. And yeah, so key. You know, in terms of like learning to breathe through the pain or, right. uh, you know, cause like exercise is one of those things where it's like, yes, it's, it's like painful in a way, but it's not really like pain. Right. And right. so <laughs> and that's the same thing with birth, right. It's not pain. It's like intensity. Right. <laughs> and so learning how to breathe through that intensity is really so key, uh, in terms yeah. of that, 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 tool um to have and like i think when i was pregnant so many people like warned me of oh gosh like are you really going to do a home birth like you don't want any medications it's going to be so painful and um and I, and I was like okay like i'll just like train myself to deal with the pain and then like when i got into it 
if I remember, I was probably like five hours in. And I remember like I was in the bath with my husband and I was mm-hmm. already like fully dilated. Yeah. Uh, which for a first pregnancy, five, five hours in is generally kind of early to right. be fully dilated. But I think that's the benefits of having a home birth. Right, um, exactly. And I just remember telling my husband like, wow, this was a lot easier than I than I expected. <laughs> you know, like all I had to do was breathe. <laughs> right. Wow. And move my body. So powerful, the breath, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so like, I literally had a full list of like homeopathic remedies, herbs, right. everything, so, your toolbox is like this big. <laughs> everything. And I was like, all I needed was movement in my breath. Like I would just, yeah. you know, move in wow. circles and like, yeah. you know, just dance or whatever, or like just be hands and knees and moving and like literally just listen to my body and felt what it needed. Mm-hmm. And it was so much easier than right. I predicted. And obviously everybody's birth experience is different. <laughs> yeah. And I want to put that disclaimer, right? But I think there was a lot to say about how I prepared for that mm-hmm. event. And, and, you know, in terms of like the exercise, the mental training, like the mindset, I think is key. Yeah. Um, and all of that. So that's a little bit of kind of recommendations on exercise. And, no, and I think all that, that that's perfect because we didn't, you know, that's such a key part of the, um, the health picture. Right. And so some people don't, I don't know, they don't think about it. I think when they're planning that preconception right. phase, which is so key and to have that be like one of the major components on that, you know, on that foundations, as you were talking about, like, how can I get my body ready for this massive event? And especially right. if someone's already in like a, like you said, maybe they're the surprise or they're a little bit chronically depleted. And so maybe that exercise program hasn't been as high up in their regime. Right. <laughs> so what can they do, you know, then to have little, um, preparations at a slower rate, but to mm-hmm. still prepare their body for the birth. Yeah. And one, one of the recommendations that I love is, um, doing what we call breathing squats. So Mm -hmm. it's like you go from standing down to a a deep squat to a comfortable level and just like inhale, you know, in one direction and exhale in the other direction. And just Mm -hmm. like, you know, like bringing your arms up and back down, like as you're coming down and up through the squat. And like that can really help to just, it can almost be meditative, right? Like it's you're kind of tuning back in with your body and not only strengthening your muscles, but, you know, working with that breath and, um, it's a very easy, um, you know, like practice to do during pregnancy. And, mm-hmm. um, and then I just, I want, I also want to just come back to the importance of general movement and walking, right? Yeah, like so key. So many women, they might be dealing with edema, right. Or, right. you know, like sw- swollen ankles mm-hmm. or hip pain or sciatic pain or back yeah, pain, right. So common. All of, all of those things are, you know, just like with the menstrual cycle, the body is communicating what right. it need, Hello, right? Are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, like I, I will say I didn't experience that much of, of the physical discomforts because I addressed those issues beforehand. But there was right. one time where, um, we, my husband and I, we had gone on a, a baby moon and, yeah. um, and we went maybe ironically, um, we went to go watch the CrossFit games and Mm -hmm. (laughs) we were watching all these other people exercise, but we were sitting in the stands all day long. (laughs) And I was like six months pregnant at the time. And I definitely was experiencing like extreme sciatic pain and like back pain. I was like, Oh, I need to get up and move. Like I, like, this is the most pain I've been in this whole pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Like stuck in a bleachers or seat. Right. You know, like Mm -hmm. 90, 90 angle, you know, hip and hip and knee angle. Like this is not comfortable. And, and so I would like get up and we'd go walk around and like do some, you know, <laughs> rotations and things like that. But it was like really just such a good reminder of like, mm. oh, wow, like this is what it could feel like, you know, right. when people aren't moving their bodies. And it's really just about checking in, like I'm experiencing this symptom. What is the symptom trying to tell me? And what do I need to do to help like mitigate it? So yeah. Yeah. It's listening to the body. That's what it's all. It sounds like from the very first, when we started talking, you're like listening to what your body needs. And yeah. tuning in. But sometimes we do need advice from an expert. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> on know? how to do that. Right. Like, right. I think I'm very lucky. Like I said, right. It was a professional interest, but also a personal interest, right. right? To, to yeah. kind of get into this field. And so drive. <laughs> I had the, I already had kind of the knowledge base and all of this stuff, you know, in terms of like how to listen to my body. And I would say yeah. even more like now compared to the last time I got pregnant, like 
I know so much more about my body now than before right. that. And I was like, wow, I thought I knew a lot back then. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like every, every cycle that you have every day that you go by, it's like, you know, just tuning in a little bit more. And mm -hmm. there's really so much that's, that's being communicated. Yeah. And this, things are going to continue to shift and change too, as we move forward with new knowledge and then, you know, how things are shifting on the planet um, as yeah. well. Um, I wanted to talk about, you mentioned in the beginning about your fun new program that you have, just the, the birthing mama's moon circle, just cause I just love when I was reading about it on your website and I just want to, if you could ex talk about it for a little bit, I know we're running <laughs> out of time, but it's just a key piece of bringing that female connection to, to um, our conversation. Totally. So, um, I would definitely say like, you know, just like when I was in that preconception period and I was doing all of this research and trying to learn everything and, and I was listening to podcasts and reading books and like talking to anybody who I knew, but like nobody was really like on the same page as me. I'm a little bit of an outlier in terms of how I approach health and my philosophy mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. And so like, I never really found my community, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and so that was kind of one of the reasons why I decided to create this, um, birthing mama's moon circle was because I wanted to provide a space mm -hmm. where we can connect with women directly, right? Like, you know, I love podcasts and they're great, but they are one sided, right? Like right. <laughs> you're, you're consuming information and it's not developing a, you know, a face to face relationship. And so right. they definitely have their place in terms of like building, you know, you know, spreading knowledge and learning and all of that. Mm -hmm. But it, it also is wonderful to be able to then reciprocate and have that relationship afterward. Right. And so, um, so that would, I would say is like one of the reasons why I wanted to host this group was to provide like an intimate space, right? Like we're, we're limiting it to 10 people, um, where we can connect one-on-one -on -one with, with other women who might be anywhere in the spectrum of the motherhood transition. Right. So that could mean being pregnancy curious, right? Like kind of in that phase of, mm -hmm. hmm, I think I want to have a baby <laughs> and then, you know, learning about what that looks like. And then, you know, you could be pregnant or like maybe ha have had a pregnancy loss or, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe newly postpartum or have a two year old or, you know, right. I would so say kind of transition. anywhere along that transition, you know, um, there can really be such value to being able to connect with other women mm -hmm. who have either just experienced what you are about to experience or, you know, are on the other end. Right. right. And so, um, so that's been, we just had our first session last week, Yay! but it, um, you know, it's been really so like fulfilling for me to be able to provide that space for women to connect. And then to also like share all of the wisdom that I've gained, you know, and I, and I'm also, I'm co-facilitating with, um, a sacred, a sacred pregnancy coach as well. And so, oh, wow, um, wonderful. and so, and she's, um, you know, I don't know how old she is, but, uh, you know, a little bit older, uh, yeah. already has, has adult children. And so, yeah. um, so it's, it's nice to have that, um, variation of, of ages mm -hmm. for, for women to be able to connect. And, um, really my goal was to help women to, to have that kind of wise woman community that they're craving to right. be able to enter into their motherhood journey informed and confident, right? There's so many things that, especially in today's birth culture that like, there's so many things you have to know about the system in order to birth within the system, if right. that's what you choose. Yeah. Um, but then also like, you know, so much of comments that people receive when they're pregnant or even before that, it's like, mm -hmm. um, it impairs people's, it impairs people's confidence, right? Like it, right. uh, it scares them into thinking that, oh no, like I can't do this or I wasn't built for this. Or, you know, the worst is that, when women are told that, you know, oh, your hips are too small, you can't birth a baby, or like mm. your boobs are too small, you can't breastfeed. It's like nonsense. That's crap. <laughs> yeah, don't <laughs> listen to that out there. <laughs> you know, or like, you know, when doctors, when um, they'll do ultrasounds to then predict the size of the baby, and like they right. might over predict the size and say, oh, your baby's too big. And it's like, right. well, no, ultrasound isn't actually that accurate. So. Right. Yes. <laughs> and, and it can be scary to some women. Yeah. And so like, that's kind of, um, you know, 
it's definitely, I'm not providing advice in this group. It's more mm -hmm. of like a support group kind mm -hmm. of environment where, we, where we're learning together, right? We're constantly right. seeking out information and also just sharing thoughts and opinions and, and feelings. And I really like to encourage, you know, living instinctually, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm always talking about like listening to your body and in your mm -hmm. intuition. And, and that really is such a valuable tool to have when you become a mother, right? Like mm -hmm. to be able to um, take in information and like then let that then challenge your beliefs, right? And say like, okay, how do I feel about this? When I'm getting right. this information, <laughs> even if it's from doctors, right? Or right. even if it's from the right. American right. Pediatric right. Association. Right. There's <laughs> lots of different sources. You know? Yeah. you know, and so there's some recommendations that for me at least really challenged my beliefs. And I was like, oh gosh, like this really doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. And right. like, mm -hmm. if it doesn't feel right, there's a reason for that. Right. And I'm not saying don't listen to your doctor. I'm not saying like, don't follow guidelines, but I am saying inform yourself, right? right. Like Get learn informed, about right. the actual yes. risk. Ask and <laughs> you know, like for me, a big part of, uh, you know, one of those things was co-sleeping, right? And like, mm -hmm. everyone's like, oh, I can't believe you're co-sleeping. Like that in increases the risks of SIDS. And it's like, well, not actually. Not, <laughs> right, yeah, not like, if you're doing it safely and not yeah. if you're breastfeeding. And, right. you know, it's actually the safest way to do it. And so yeah. there's, you know, I'm not trying to say that there's one best way to do things um, for everything is it's dependent on the family and their, mm -hmm. um, their values and what, you know, what they prefer and all of those things. But um, there is also like the biologically normal way that things happen. Right. And so, um, so anyway, so that's kind of the general, um, you know, basis behind why we're, why we're providing this group. And then also, I think there's a real, a real value to helping women to, you know, connect with their babies before they're born. Right. right. Like so often women are going into an ultrasound and they're like, oh, I can't wait to connect with my baby, right? To, to see my baby on the screen. Right. And it's like, your baby's inside of you all the time. You don't right. need a screen to tell you right. that your baby's alive, right? Like yeah. if you are in tune with yourself, and that's one of the, I would say one of the biggest benefits of, of tuning in with yourself mm. beforehand is you can sense when something's going wrong, right? Yeah. Like the, the maternal instinct is very strong. And totally. mm -hmm. um if baby's not moving, if, you know, mm -hmm. if you're like, you're not feeling any kicks right. or, like, or whatever. Feel right. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. And so like, and so one of the things that um, both uh, my co-facilitator and I really hope to do is to help women to like, to be confident in bonding with their baby mm -hmm. in that preconception period and through pregnancy. And, right. and to really help to nurture that bond because that early attachment can can be so valuable in the entire motherhood motherhood journey right um, but you know but it really begins in the beginning so um and, and helping women to to really understand this as like it's a rite of passage right like you're mm -hmm. going from being a maiden to a mother right where right. there's a change in identity and that doesn't necessarily mean that's a bad thing right, right. like you change as a person <laughs> but it enhances the person who you already were right, right. and so exactly. so that's something that um I like, I would say the underlying goal behind all of this, you know, both in the nutrition work that I do, as well as in my supporting mothers and things like that, um, is really about trusting yourself, you know, learning to connect with your intuition, you know, living instinctually and consciously. And then, mm -hmm. and then to also like question the way things are and, if that's how you want to continue them, right? right like exactly. Whether it's in parenting strategies or whatever, it's like, this is how I was raised. Is this how I want to also do things? Right. And it's, and it's really up to us. And so I think it's so empowering to be able to live in that way and say like, I'm choosing to live this way. And, yeah. and, uh, and there's so much, so much value to that. Yeah. Uh, I just, thank you for sharing about the circle. I, it's such a huge part of the, you know, that's, it's missing. Um, a place for women, you know, there's groups, but it's, it's a whole different type of community when you're coming together with 
um, other women who are in that same part, like almost we were talking about that, like kind of like that phase where, cause it's so different and they don't have someone to talk to about it. And then, you know, that's our roots as, as women on the planet is, you know, we've had women's circles for <laughs> as long as we can remember, you know, through writings yeah. on the wall and things like that, you know? So uh, thank you for starting that for your community. Um, and it's only, it's a, not a zoom thing or, or it is, it is actually through zoom, at least right now. I would love to do them in person um, mm -hmm. once all the quarantine measures are right. resolved. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, but I, I think we might, I might do both, right? So um, right. I might do a virtual option, but also, you know, like some of the people um, in my group right now are on the East Coast. Um, and nice. so, so it, it is nice to be able to offer that to people who are, are kind of in the extended community. Because, mm -hmm. you know, there is like that definite, definite benefit to being in person and, and in community mm -hmm. in that way. But I think also having that face-to-face -face interaction, even if it is over Zoom, you know, right. there's still to that and, and connection there. Yeah. Okay, great. Good. And then ways for people to... Um, uh, get in touch with you and make an appointment with one of your fertility um, nutrition coaching package. So go to your website. Is that right? At um, uh, anisawoodall.com. Yes. So anisawoodall.com is kind of the central place for all of my <laughs> offerings. Um, you mm -hmm. can also go to anisawoodall.com forward slash offerings to, to, to see everything there. Oh, um, perfect. And um, you know, I kind of change what I'm offering based on the needs of the community. Right. And so yeah. this, Moon Circle was really kind of inspired um, just before the quarantine actually began. Um, but it's something that I really feel like I want to continue doing at least for the next year. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the real food resets that I do, um, you know, and then also the, the coaching packages. So um, fertility nutrition coaching package is, is one of the, the main ones that I'm offering right now. And, um, and so you can definitely go to my website to do that. If, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can definitely uh, email me from there if you have questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also on Instagram at Anissa Woodall Nutrition. Um, and then for, you know, for people who are interested um, in getting a free download from mm -hmm. my website, um, you Great. can go to anissawoodall.com forward slash free download. And I offer, currently I'm offering two um, eBooks. So one of them is top five first foods for a nourished baby. And those were all things that I made for my son when he was starting solids. Oh, that's um, great. Foods that mm, you wouldn't really see in a, in a general like starting solids book. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and then another uh, one is um, my top five tips for cycle induced sugar and carb cravings. So mm, that can definitely perfect. be helpful right now for people. <laughs> yeah, totally. So that's great. So they can find all that information on your website for downloading the free mm -hmm. ebooks. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. There's well, one ebook that I wrote um, that isn't free. Um, you can access that at anisawoodall.com forward slash book. And um, it, it's a book available on Amazon Kindle. Um, okay. And that one is called uh, The Natural Mama's Guide for Newborn Essentials for Mindful, Healthy, and Eco-Friendly Living. So. Oh, great. People should definitely <laughs> download that one. That one sounds awesome, too. I'm going to check all of those out. <laughs> <laughs> so many resources. <laughs> no, I love it. And then so you and also you have a podcast that you're going to be launching soon. And what's the name of that? So it's the Woodall Wellness Podcast. We're going to be mm -hmm. launching it in the next couple of weeks. But um, it's a podcast I'm doing with my husband, who's uh, Dr. Mark Woodall, also a naturopathic doctor, right. who's a colleague of yours. Yeah. Um, and so we're just kind of planning on talking about a whole, a whole lot of things. So we're, <laughs> the well, wellness is kind of the umbrella term for everything we want to nice. talk about, but from sustainability to parenting, to nutrition and movement and, and everything in between. So, Perfect. Um, you know, anything that, w that gets us excited about yeah. <laughs> conscious living, like we're going to talk about it. <laughs> nice. I love it. Well, it sounds like you got some good things in the hopper. <laughs> yeah, totally. Thank you so much for, for having, uh, having me on and, yeah, and I'm excited to, it's been yeah. wonderful. Um, and thanks for listening and tuning in everyone. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Done. <laughs>